or good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us today. I am Emmy Betts and I serve as the Deputy Director for the Injury and Violence Prevention Center here at the University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus. Today's presentation is part of our monthly research to practice webinar series, where we present topics in injury and violence prevention. Today, we're very happy to be co-sponsoring and co-hosting with the Multidisciplinary Center on Aging, also located on the University of Colorado Anschutz campus. So before I jump into today's uh, session, a few logistics. We are recording this session and we will send out the video link to everyone who's registered. Uh, you can also find past webinars online and we'll put that link in the chat box. Um, during the session, please put any questions you might have into the Q&A box and we will have a, a joint Q&A session at the end. Um, mark your calendars for our other webinars. They're always on the second Tuesday of the month at noon Mountain Time. And next, next month we'll be talking about opioid use disorder and ED screening and initiation of treatment. And then after today, if you're excited to keep talking about uh, uh, fall prevention and uh, treatment of falls, you can join us tomorrow, that's Wednesday, at 4 p.m. Mountain Time for an informal discussion group. If you're interested, please contact uh, either Lucia Turpak, who you got, you got the registration from, or you can contact me. And so now it is my great pleasure to introduce today's speakers. Uh, falls are one of the most concerning issues for those who fall and their loved ones and healthcare providers and public health professionals. Um, but sometimes we don't even know when falls occur. And today we're gonna be diving into kind of both sides, both how we um, treat and prevent future falls, but also how we identify what's happening uh, in real time. Our first speaker today is Dr. Rebecca Griffith, who I am so fortunate to work with in the emergency department here at the University of Colorado Hospital. Dr. Griffith graduated with her Bachelor of Arts uh, in Kinesiology and Applied Physiology, uh, followed by a doctorate in Physical Therapy, both from the University of Colorado. She's since become a board certified neurologic clinical specialist, and she works part-time as a physical therapist specializing in emergency and intensive care uh, at the University of Colorado Hospital. She's also an appointed clinical instructor within the University of Colorado School of Medicine. Dr. Griffith also serves as the Chief Delegate for Colorado to the American Physical Therapy Association, and she serves the community as a clinical preceptor at the Dawn Clinic for uninsured uh, patients in Aurora. So she's going to be talking about the fantastic program um, in the emergency department around uh, using physical therapy to both uh, identify risk for future falls, um, as well as uh, uh, treatment and care for patients who have sustained injuries after a fall. So then we'll move to Dr. Kathy Bodine, who uh, is an associate professor in the Department of Bioengineering at the College of Engineering, Design and Computing at the University of Colorado Denver campus. She also has secondary appointments in the departments of physical medicine and rehabilitation, orthopedics and pediatrics on the Anschutz Medical Campus. She directs the Center for Inclusive Design and Engineering, or CEDA, which a with a focus on assistive, medical, and accessible mainstream technologies, uh, interdisciplinary research and education, and then translational applications of medical and assistive technology design innovations. Uh, she's the Director of, in of Innovation Ecosystem at the Clinical Colorado Clinical Translational Sciences Institute. And she is leading the development of an interdisciplinary PhD, master's and undergraduate program in the Department of Bioengineering focused on inclusive technology, disability and aging. Dr. Bonina is widely published in her field. She serves on numerous uh, leadership committees and has served as the PI on multiple grants. Uh, we're thrilled to have her here today to talk about some of the work that she's doing related to identification of falls in memory, in memory care settings. And so with that, let's get started. I'm gonna turn it over first to Dr. Griffith. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi everybody, thank you for the opportunity to be here. I really appreciate it. I am going to um, try to share my screen with you here. Please somebody let me know if it isn't working. Is everybody able to see that? Looks great. Great. So I apologize in advance for the glare. Um, there is literally not a good spot in my home to do a Zoom presentation. So we're going to just go with it. I also have my dog here who may chime in with her clinical expertise, which is just being loud. So 
Briefly, we are going to talk about the role of physical therapists in the emergency department. It's one of my favorite things to discuss, so I'm going to try and keep that brief. And we'll talk about what we're here to talk about. So fall prevalence, pre patient presentation to the emergency department, physical therapy and fall mitigation in the emergency department, and then what current practice would be and how we would follow up and prevent that going forward. And then I'd be happy to address any questions that you might have. So some of the potential benefits of an emergency department physical therapist uh, include increased patient satisfaction, decreasing the cost of unnecessary care, increasing the treatment options, as well as service options available in the emergency department, improving patient function and outcomes, as well as improving productivity and operations within the emergency department. So each of these has been supported by both national and international research. And while I could talk at length about all of them, I think we'll focus just on a few of them this morning or this afternoon, I guess, just to give you a little bit more of an idea of what it is that I do. So one of the number one things that people ask me is they say a physical therapist in the emergency department, what could you possibly do there? I think maybe if people really only came to the emergency department for true emergencies, that might be, there might be less of a role for me in the emergency department. But because of the types of diagnoses that people commonly present for, including head injuries, falls, back pain, sprains, strains, fractures, cognitive issues, um, home safety concerns, vestibular pathologies, there's actually quite a lot that we can offer. But improving patient function and outcomes is probably my favorite of what we do. So for one, we can initiate acute musculoskeletal treatments earlier which just to plug your opioid presentation, earlier access to physical therapy can actually decrease the need for opioid medication over the long term and lead to a cost savings there as well. Second, we really have the time to spend with patients. So we can take the time to ensure that patients understand what is happening with them, how we can explain what a good treatment plan for them would be, and then what follow-up care we recommend so that that patient leaves the emergency department feeling like, they were examined, treated, heard, understood, and have a way to be empowered themselves in their care going forward, obviously for those physical therapy type diagnoses. And then lastly, what we're gonna to discuss today, how to reduce fall risk and improve functional mobility with our specific discharge planning expertise. So from a physical therapy perspective, we define a fall as any event that leads to an unplanned, unexpected contact with a supporting surface, such as a floor or piece of furniture, that is not the result of a push or a shove or the result of a medical attack such, or a medical event, such as a heart attack or fainting. So all of those syncopal falls that we get referrals for, we're still, still going to address those, but we're going to consider those a little bit separately than a typical mechanical fall would be. I think it's also important to notice here that if a patient is having unexpected contact with a wall or a piece of furniture, we are still considering that as a fall and that goes into their fall risk classification. They do not actually have to fall all the way to the floor or slide from their chair or any other things. I hear people say, well, they almost fell. If they weren't planning to lose their balance and they were not able to recover it, that's a fall. Okay, so everything on this screen is an example of a, of a factor that increases your risk of falls. So you have your environmental factors, fatigue, advanced age, female gender actually has a slightly higher risk of falls, the type of footwear that you have, your health status, leg pain, fear of falling or a history of falling, using adaptive equipment such as walkers or canes or crutches, visual issues, um, vertigo or other kind of dizziness, impaired blood pressure, whether abnormally high or abnormally low, or somebody who maybe has that autonomic issue where it varies from time from day to day. You can have memory issues that can contribute to falling. Recent hospitalizations are highly correlated with increased risk of falls. Sedentary behaviors or lifestyles, polypharmacy and flexibility issues. So those are just the main risk factors for falls. And I think you can see that there's a lot on there. And I'm sure we can all picture in our minds a patient who probably has every single one of these or one person who has just one and they're still having a huge issue with falls. So the fallout of falls, just to briefly discuss prevalence and impact, one in four Americans over the age of 65 falls every year. 
Every 11 seconds, an older adult is treated in the emergency room for a fall. And every 19 minutes, an older adult actually succumbs to the injuries from their fall. Falls are the leading cause of fatal injuries and the most common cause of non-fatal trauma-related hospital admissions among older adults. So if you think of all of that like prevalence and number of injuries that is occurring, I want you to consider the financial toll of that. So that would come out to about 800,000 hospitalizations, more than 27,000 deaths. And in 2015, the total cost was about $50 billion and Medicare and Medicaid actually shouldered 75% of the cost. So we're expecting that the financial toll will continue to increase as we have a large population and may re reach nearly $70 billion in the coming years. So you can see that it's a huge issue. It's also a huge number of the reasons that patients are coming to your emergency departments, coming to your hospitals, and maybe possibly needing physical therapy services or ongoing treatment after that. So I think it's important to determine what we can do. So we're gonna just discuss the role of the physical therapist. So particularly in the emergency department, these are the steps that we go through, but a physical therapist in any setting, whether that would be a placement setting such as subacute rehab, acute rehab, home care, or outpatient clinic would go through these different steps. And I want you to consider in your practice, whether you're a physician assistant or an RN or a physician, would you have the time and the know-how to really examine each of these steps? And I think it's critical to know that there is somebody who can help you identify and manage all of these facets and these risk factors, and that would be the physical therapist. So the first thing we would do is take a detailed history. Within that history, we are going to try and suss out which of those many things on that slide, those many risk factors, is part of their history that may have contributed to the fall. So that would include what medical conditions that person has, what kind of falls they've had in the past, what medications they might take, what comorbidities they have that may be contributing to those falls. And we'll also find out their um, social support. Do they live by themselves? Do they have others in their home? Do they have animals that might be part of the issue? What kind of support will they have after this fall? And then we'll complete a screening. That screening, it sounds brief. It's really more of a, um, a detailed examination. We'll include their visual status, their hearing, how their cognition is. Do they have the problem solving ability to do a task in their home? Then we'll examine their strength and their flexibility and also their social determinants of health. Does this patient have a home? Is it a home that's accessible to them? Does this patient have access to food? Are they safe in their home? Do they understand their medical conditions? What is their health literacy? And how will that contribute to the recurrence of falls? We'll also do a home safety assessment. What does their home look like? Do they have stairs outside of their home? Do they have stairs inside of their home? Many of the patients that I see in the emergency department might fall and end up with an ankle fracture and a wrist fracture, but they already use a walker at baseline and now they have a 20 pound bulky Jones and they can't walk. They can't wait there through two extremities. And I might be asked to get that patient prepared for discharge. If that patient has 30 stairs inside their home in order to reach a bathroom, that's an issue that we need to find a better solution to. So the home safety assessment is crucial. Then we'll complete a mobility assessment. The mobility assessment always includes vital signs. What are the patient's vital signs at rest? How does that change when they're moving? Many patients might actually be falling because they're hypoxic with mobility, but that hasn't been detected or assessed because in other examinations, their vitals have only been examined at rest. So we might see, does this patient have some hemodynamic instability that's contributing to this issue? Is this patient breathing well? Can they manage their oxygen tank while they're walking? Do they need an assistive device to help keep them upright? Will the assistive device be too taxing for them cognitively? And trying just to determine what is the biggest barrier? Do they, are they lacking force production? Are they lacking strength? Is it a flexibility issue? Do they have the depth perception to manage their safely? So those are all pieces of the mobility assessment that we consider. Then we'll do formal balance testing. That balance testing will give us specific repeatable objective measures that we can do with patients 
multiple times to either um, address fall risk or like progression of uh, functional loss, or it'll help us determine discharge disposition. If a patient is rated as a very high fall risk, we have different uh, literature that can support whether or not a patient should be discharged to a rehab facility or is safe to be community dwelling. So we'll use those balance testing measures to help us determine what type of balance issue the patient is having as well. Is it an anticipatory balance issue? Is it a reactive balance issue? Is it related to their visual system, their vestibular system, or their somatosensory system? And then how can we either remediate those issues, prevent future falls, or then accommodate the issues that they do, do have so that they keep them safe? And then our intervention or our follow-up is what we would do as physical therapists help, again, remediate those issues, prevent future occurrences, and then accommodate any needs that they might have. And we'll do that through a variety of ways. In the emergency department, the goal is different than it would be in an outpatient clinic. In an outpatient clinic, your focus truly is on prevention and how and remediation and how to make this patient as safe as they possibly can so that they can continue living safely in their home. In the emergency department, the role is slightly different. My goal with every patient in the emergency department is how do I get them out of the emergency department? How do I safely move them to the next step? And so our interventions here are going to be more temporary and sometimes more focused on safety. So can this patient return to their prior living situation with some assistance from family? If that's the case, we'll do family training to help make sure that the family feels comfortable caring for that patient. Do, can this patient return home with some home care services? Would a nurse managing their medications lead to fewer medication errors, which might be part of the cause of their balance issues? If so, we'll recommend that. Would having a physical therapist and an occupational therapist coming into the home help them with their mobility and ADLs within the home help prevent falls going forward? Then that would be something we'd recommend. Now, if this patient is, again, that, that elderly person with a fracture who now can't go up three stairs, they can't stay in the emergency department, but they can't really be admitted to the hospital either. So at that point, we would determine what is the most safe and logical place for this patient to go. And we'll make recommendations whether a patient would go to a skilled rehab facility, either a subacute rehab facility or an acute rehab facility. And several factors go into their those two decisions. Some include medical stability or complexity, and some include a patient's ability to tolerate therapy. So a subacute placement would be more beneficial for a patient who perhaps really has deconditioned, has several medical conditions, and can only participate in shorter duration bouts of therapy. Versus an acute rehab, who if you had a patient who say was one of your well elderly in the community who say had a bicycle accident, but has multi-trauma from that, they may be really appropriate to do aggressive physical therapy in an acute rehab setting where they would have consistently three hours or more of therapy each day to help return them to their higher level of function. The other thing that I think is important here is because we talked about those several different risk factors, I think it's important to note that a physical therapist cannot manage all of those independently and that the best approach for any patient who's falling is, a, is an interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary approach. And one of the interventions that we had had in place was a falls clinic. And that clinic was staffed by a gerontologist, a pharmacist, a physical therapist, and an occupational therapist, so that the patient could truly be examined from multiple lenses to help determine why they were falling, complete regular outcome measures and follow-up, as well as a program to keep them moving on the right track. Unfortunately, uh, our gerontologist who was running the program has moved on to, I think, out of the country, perhaps. So if anybody's interested in perhaps uh, engaging in another project like that, we'd love to hear from you. All right. Let's see. And then why does this matter in the emergency department? We talked a little bit about this. Like, what are we going to do with this patient? How are we going to discharge them? But I think the biggest thing to note is that research actually shows that if physical therapist recommendations are followed at discharge, the patient is three times less likely to bounce back to the emergency department. And that includes any, in the, any acute care hospitalization setting. The mismatch between discharge recommendations and what the patient was actually given in services when they left 
led to a pretty significant difference between groups. Another study was completed retroactively by assessing Medicare billing data. So patients were looked at who presented to the emergency department with falls. And of the patients who were billed for evaluation by a physical therapist in the emergency department, the injury, the re-injury rate was significantly lower, as was the bounce back uh, rate, which leads to a huge cost savings for Medicare to actually have the physical therapist intervene right away. And then physical therapy recommendations for transitions in care for our older adults, whether they've been living in the home and it's really time for them to transition to a, a new care setting, following those recommendations has also led to a decreased prevalence of falls. I think the other thing that we've noticed in the literature is if a patient discharges from, say, the emergency department to a subacute rehab facility, but the evaluation and instructions and notes from the physical therapist do not travel with the patient, that that seems to be the key um, piece of information pass off that is needed to help patients be successful at their next level of care. So I think we've talked a little bit about why it's important for discharge and bounce back. And then as far as prevention goes, I think we can all see from the prevalence rates and the incidence and the cost that prevention is going to be our most valuable intervention. And by doing that, I would just like to really summarize by saying physical therapy has been shown to reduce falls in all levels of patient populations. And so I'd like to encourage you to choose PT and I'm gonna put a link in the chat so you can find the Choose PT website so you can access physical therapists near you if it's not currently part of your practice to refer to physical therapists. And I'll be happy to address any questions that you have. Great, thank you so much. Uh, and what we'll do is move on, yes. is move on to, to Dr. Bodine and um, to the audience again, please put questions in the Q&A or the chat. Thanks. Thank you. All right, Rebecca, thank you so much for such a lovely talk. Um, so I'm gonna go to the other end of the spectrum at this point and talk about what happens when someone falls how can we detect it and how can we triage and get the right care to this individual um, as soon as they need it, okay? So I'm gonna talk about a project we've been working on called Research and Development of a Fall Detection and Notification Sensor System for Seniors with Dementia. And I wanna preface this by saying the standard of care in memory care facilities is to check on every single patient every 30 minutes. But what happens when that, per that a uh, medical professional closes the door and two seconds later, someone falls. They may be there for another 30 minutes until someone comes back to them. So I want to give full credit. We have a litany of folks that have been working on this for a number of years, but our current team is Dr. Vitaly Kaifetz, who is a professor in the Department of Bioengineering and two master's degree students, Ahmed Abdu and Katie, Katie Gray. And they all together, this is a team effort. So I wanna make sure and give my teammates lots of credit for this work. Okay, if you haven't seen this paper, it's, I, it's really worth the read. It was actually published back in 2012. So it's getting a little bit old, but what I love about it is the study was a video capture of the circumstances of falls in the elderly people residing in long-term care. And it was an observational study. And there's actually a link, if you haven't seen this, to a YouTube video where you can really get a sense of how is it that seniors fall. You know, it's not like we're walking around and suddenly do a face plant, you know, maybe, but that's fairly unusual. Falls are very, very complex and they're very, very difficult to understand unless you see them happening. So you don't always know what's happened to your patient um, in terms of how they fell. So this was really particularly interesting to me on a, on a personal level, because my mom, had, who just passed away a couple months ago, um, had severe dementia and lived in a memory care facility. And I would get these calls in the middle of the night and they would say, Kathy, we found your mom on the floor. Do you want us to send her to the hospital? And that was always the question. And I never knew how serious it was. Um, when we talk with our partners in Anthem Memory Care, they also tell us they're concerned. And they had a patient who fell in their room. No one saw it. 
And she got up and because she had dementia, she forgot she had fallen, wasn't able to communicate it even if she had remembered. And she died a few hours later of a subdural hematoma. So Anthem is highly motivated to work with us on this project. We're also joined by Benchmark Technologies who are working with us on the sensor development. Okay, so let's get into this. What is it that we're doing? Well, we have this vision that if someone falls, there will be an immediate alert to the staff and there will be some assessment of the fall by the sensor and the um, math that we have sitting in a little Android device. And I'll talk more about this in a minute. But the idea is what kind of fall was it? Did someone fall and land on their bottom? Did they fall on their side? Did they hit their head first? What happened when they fell? And what were the impact forces? How hard did they hit? It's one thing to slide slowly out of a chair. It's another to fall from a full upright position straight to, the, to maybe a concrete floor or a floor that is on concrete. And then what are the likely points of trauma? Can we figure out, can we model or simulate what kind of trauma this patient experienced when they did fall? And then when, with provide that information to the clinician who finds them. And that may be a nurse aide, it may be the nurse on duty, we don't know, but whoever finds them, whoever is immediately alerted to this fall can get there and have a little bit of additional information so that they can make a good clinical decision. Is the patient okay or not okay? What are our next steps and what should we do? So that's our vision. Well, how are we going to do this? For people with severe dementia in particular, and I should back up a second, you know, we've all seen the Philips Lifeline commercial, I've fallen and I can't get up. If you're old enough, you've seen it, right? Okay, well, what we know about all these bracelets and pendants and wearable watches and all these things is number one, accuracy isn't as good as we'd like. And number two, we also know that 80% of seniors forget to put it on or choose not to wear it because especially those living at home, they don't like it. For seniors with dementia and particularly significant dementia, putting a wearable device on them can be very tricky. So that's something we'll talk about in just a bit. But the idea is to have a, a patient wearing a sensor patch when they fall, we have a low energy Bluetooth device who communicates to a mobile device that the um, medical practitioners have on hand in their pocket or wherever. Um, and then it lets them know that someone has fallen and how they've fallen, in this case on their left side, okay? So let's talk a little bit about what's going on out there. Well, there are lots of people studying this. That's not a problem. There's lots of people out there, but most people tend to go with vision-based methods or cameras. Um, and those are fairly accurate in terms of knowing if someone's fallen and the fall specificity is fairly good with those. So it's not a wearable, you know, you don't have to have anything on your body because there's cameras everywhere. But here's the problem. Users don't like the idea of cameras anywhere, particularly this generation of seniors. That's something they, they feel like their, their privacy has been truly invaded. And frankly, it has. Um, there are acoustic sensors or noise. There are pressure sensors, there are different things like that are being um, looked at, but there haven't been a lot of really solid developments that, that are really working well. And so the next um, most research method is acceleration-based methods. How fast do you fall? And the accuracy on that's pretty high and the fall specificity is also good. Um, so it's a very simple analysis. Most importantly, there are no cameras. But the cons are that it's a wearable device. And as I just said, a lot of seniors don't like to wear something on their body all the time. So what are we gonna do about it? That was our first question. Well, we decided the first thing we wanted to do was to really develop a computational model of falling that was much more accurate um, than what we're seeing out there. We wanted to be able to estimate how hard someone fell. Um, and that varies, again, depending on surface type. Um, one thing to fall on grass, another thing to fall on a paved parking lot, right? Um, we wanted to get really good accelerometer or speed readings and also gyroscope readings. So we want to know how someone falls. Are they twisting? What's going on? And we then, of course, in order to do this, once we develop the algorithm, we have to train it. So naturally, we used our graduate students as victims. 
um, for this first pass through. So we had 10 grad students do nine different types of fall, all on nice, safe mats, of course, um, with the idea of training the algorithm. OK, so getting that. And again, these are healthy young students, so their fall was a bit different from seniors, but nonetheless, we needed to see if we could train the algorithm and how accurate it was. And then the next stage that we're working on now is to establish communication and having that mobile application. And we'll talk about all of that in just a second. Okay, so developing the computational model of falling. Okay, so some of you that have seen these in, in college, I know Rebecca was laughing a little bit earlier because she's seen this for sure. Um, so the first thing to do is understand what happens and what does gait look like? So the first thing we did was go out there and find all of the walking simulations, the things that are out there that we could find. And then, of course, we needed to move on to fall. Okay, so um, we started by simulating the barometer, the accelerometer, and the gyroscope data. So this was our early stage first pass just to see, okay, can we get accurate measurements? Are we calibrated correctly? So this was our baseline kind of work that we did here. Okay, our next phase was really looking at simulating this accelerometer and gyroscope data. So the first thing was um, simulating just basic walking. Now, as many of you know, not all seniors have that nice, healthy stride, right? So the next thing we had to do is look at the different types of gait patterns. And so this is an example of a crouched gait pattern. So you can see how that varies quite a bit from the traditional. And our, our issue is we need our sensor to understand all of these different types of patterns and when there is a difference um, in terms of this person's particular gait speed and walking pattern. Um, or falling pattern, right? So this is our latest. This is actually a fall simulation. I'm gonna run it at half speed so you can see that we're now able to really get a decent look at all of those falls we recorded with our students, which means we can translate this now to our seniors. And so um, we can basically get a good look at what's going to happen and you can also see that additional bounce that occurs when someone falls it's not like we fall in this and all of a sudden it's static there are lots of other things and those are what can often cause additional trauma to um, a senior who has fallen right if they if their head hits again once they've fallen maybe bounces then that can can be pretty serious stuff so we want to make sure that we're able to capture what is going on with the entire body so we did all that good stuff. And then of course we take our data and this is what's called the confusion matrix. And this is a way that we were looking at a sitting fall. So someone who's starting to sit and they fall. And the idea is, can we get to a very high degree of accuracy? And as you can see in this particular matrix, and we have a matrix for all of these um, different types of fall, but our data has gotten really, really good. And we're really pleased with this because this is the first and most important step in our development project is ensuring that we're collecting the kind of data that is really going to be honest and truthful when that medical professional is, is trying to figure out what to do with this patient. Okay, so again, the idea is we're going to have this um, person with the patch, we're going to have the communication to a mobile device, and then we're going to use various algorithms to determine what has happened to that individual. But there's this clinical translational piece um, showing um, a medical practitioner all of these graphs in real time when they're running to capture and, and to see what's happened to their client. Not necessarily the best thing. So the next trick to this then is that clinical translation of this data into terminology and into language that is quickly and readily understood by a medical professional. And so in this case, simple to say the patient's fallen on their left side. So then they can begin their triage and begin to understand what is happening um, with their client. Our phase two, and we'll talk about this at the end, is an adhesive study, which we are literally just on our way to launching um, in the next week, where we're actually working with a memory care facility. One of the biggest things that we uh, learned early stage, and a lot of the research has shown us, that for people who are seniors, getting their arms up above their shoulders is really difficult. Reaching the small of their back is also really difficult. So what we have developed, and I'm under a non-disclosure agreement, so I can't show it to you just yet, but basically is a very small sensor. Um, and the idea is that this can go on someone's upper back, 
in an unobtrusive place. And hopefully for, for our folks with dementia, they're not going to be so aware that it is a wearable sensor on their body um, so that they can leave it alone and it can do its job. So right now, one of our key things is looking at how do we attach this? So we're looking at a study with dynamic tape and also then various like the optifone bandage and some of those things to figure out what is the safest thing to use for frail skin. We also have to detect the difference between doing Tai Chi and alterations in gait and fall. So that's the other piece of this um, study that we're embarking on. So what next? Um, as I said, we're looking at the adhesive study, which is starting <clears throat> any day now, next week actually. And then um, our phase two first clinical trial will be to then attach a faux sensor um, to the backs of a number of uh, seniors with dementia and just see how that wearability is, that user experience with having this, this little patch on their back, is that gonna make a difference? How long is the battery gonna last? That kind of thing. So we're really working through those technical issues um, right in this next few weeks. And then we'll be doing, first we'll do a phase two clinical trial, um, just a pilot of our clinical trial study, which will be happening probably around May, April or May. And then we will be conducting a full scale clinical trial in the fall of 2021. So we're very excited about that particular study. And I was loving it when Rebecca, you were talking about Tyson as the former uh, physician. He was also working with me on this study prior to him leaving the country. So um, what are we doing next and other things that we're looking at? We're also looking at clinical tools for assessing balance. Our geriatric physicians tell us the Romberg test has been around since I think they said 1852. Um, so looking at, can we come up with a sensor that can maybe be put on someone's belt, uh, something very simple so that we can get real quantitative data instead of you know trying to figure out by pulling on someone uh, what their balance looks like, and also um, beginning discussions around a clinical tool that could be used um, in, in the clinic to measure gait speed and potentially look at that as an indicator for mortality and morbidity, um, or as the sixth vital sign, as our physicians are telling us. So those are the projects. I went, went a little more detail, obviously, in our fall detection, and then some other things that we are beginning to look into and beginning to try to get some development. We're always interested in new ideas. I have tons of students who are looking for projects and um, would be happy to uh, talk to you about any questions or anything that you might be interested in. So thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Um, that was, those were both wonderful presentations. I loved those videos. Um, really cool. <laughs> so um, I wanted to also reflect before, before we jump into the Q&A, reflect um, how interesting it was to me as an injury prevention professional and a, and a clinician to really hear your similar, although different perspectives and, and really how the work you're doing is being adapted to particular environments. So, uh, you know, Dr. Griffith talking about how we work in the ER and it's about sort of thinking about timelines and dispositions, but certainly patient outcomes. And it's a very unique environment in that sense. And then um, Dr. Bodine, I love like down to the detail of what kinds of adhesives work on, on the sort of older, on the frail skin of older adults. Um, shows just how complicated this is, but also I think how wonderful these interventions can be when they are really thoughtfully tailored to the, to the environments where we are um, going to use them. So um, we've got two questions so far that I will jump into and then um, audience certainly please keep them coming. Um, so the first I think is for Dr. Griffith. Uh, how do you typically assess dual tasking in the EDs? Um, and then also wondering about whether occupational therapists are involved yet or currently. So I think that's a great question. Part of the, the concern with the environment of the emergency department is that anything in the ED is dual tasking. There's so much noise. There are so many people. There are wires, all kinds of things. But some of the things that I do are I'll have my patients try and figure out where they're going. Can you find the bathroom from here? Can you see if we turn left here, can you find your way back to your room? Or I'll talk to them about something like, tell me where you met your wife who's in the room there and see if they can look at me and walk at the same time. Sometimes I will have them give them a plan. I want you to, after you take six steps, stop, pick this up off the ground for me and then turn around. Um, it just depends on the patient. Sometimes it's very clear, very quickly that they cannot dual task. 
Um, and as to the occupational therapy question, we pull our occupational therapists in very regularly particularly if a patient isn't safe to go home. If I have real concerns that I don't feel like I can address independently and cannot be addressed with prompt follow-up from an occupational therapist. For example, if I send you home today and I can get an OT into your home tomorrow, is that sufficient for today? It may be. In other cases, it's not. And so we'll call our occupational therapist and they'll join us for evaluations or they'll evaluate either before or after we do. They do have a big role in our emergency department at assessing cognition. Also, most patients, when I read in their chart that there's a concern for medication noncompliance or misunderstanding, I have my occupational therapist come and speak to those patients as well. And I think that we will start to see more of a presence of our OTs coming soon. That would, it would be wonderful. I, I wish I could have the power to make that happen. <laughs> I, I would just say stay tuned. Yeah, that's wonderful. And although I feel like the next time I see you in the ED and I ask you something or you ask me to do something, I'm going to be like watching you to see if you're assessing my multitasking abilities. <laughs> Um, yeah, wonderful. Uh, next question is for you, Dr. Bodine. Um, so uh, uh, question is, my 98-year-old non-demented father wants to know if there's any engineering research for implantable devices that can help seniors prevent falls, something to help with balance, perhaps. And I think you were touching a little bit on this on the end, but any thoughts yeah. on that? Yeah, that's a, it's really a great question. And it's kind of um, prescient because that Clearly, you know, lots of research is going on out there. I think what you see the most right now is really in terms of the implantables. There are, well, I'll answer it in two different ways. The first way is to say that most of the research currently is really around Parkinson's, um, that type of implantable, really looking at the more severe end. Um, and we're not yet at a, uh, a point where it's that fine tuned, if you will. Um, do I think something could happen in the next 10 to 15 years? Absolutely. Um, but, but the other answer to that is I did a, it was like a three-day workshop uh, about, a, well, it was pre-COVID, right before COVID, I think the October before COVID. Um, and it was with the National Academy of Medicine and Engineering and Science and all that. Um, anyway, the long story short is we were looking at ethics in um, implantables, cognitive technologies, those types of things and things where um, we're really looking at that. And unfortunately, a big piece of the puzzle that hasn't been resolved just yet is the um, regulatory and um, the ethical considerations for when and where and how do we use implantables? Um, what do we, when, particularly um, even people who are older that are not demented, um, you know, it's just as a natural course of aging, we do have some changes in, in, our, in our sensory systems, in our cognition, whatever. And so how do we make these decisions and, and what are we going to do about it? So that's like an ongoing thing that is constantly kind of in, in my background, if you will, is really trying to stay on top of that and understand where we're going next. And there, you know, from a regulatory perspective on the FDA side, that's pretty serious stuff when you look at implantables at this point, particularly neuro implantables. Um, and they, that hasn't really been shushed out in the way we need it to be. And so I think that's kind of, it's not stopping research by any stretch of the imagination, but I think it's one of those pieces is when does this become like something we would consider, you know, for a patient that comes in to see a physician, when would they be referred on for that consideration? There's a lot behind that question. Mm -hmm. That's a great and, question. And a brief follow-up, I'm, I'm remembering back, I'm pretty sure we don't do these anymore, but there used to be these like external hip pad underwear things that they recommended that somehow then if you fell, you wouldn't break them. <sighs> it it yes. turned out people fell putting them on and right. I mean, are there, besides implantables, are there sort of other external wearable devices that provide feedback that wouldn't be as, as big a regulatory concern because it's not implantable, but that are smart clothing kinds of things? Yeah, that's, that's, a, I called those the expando pants. They made me laugh. I, I'm sorry, but I actually met with this company that the one you're talking about. And I was like, well, you realize when you have that airbag effect, which is like an airbag effect, first of all, if it's under your clothes, there go your clothes potentially. And secondly, 
Um, what happens if someone falls on the airbag and then hits their head with greater force, right? And so they were gonna, they had, they didn't have a real super good answer for that. Um, so what is interesting to me, and I and I didn't touch on this in my talk, but but one of the things we can do a lot with sensors right now, and there are projects um, like the. Um, contact lens that can measure blood glucose, for example. I mean, there are all kinds of crazy things coming into play very, very quickly. Um, we can already detect respira respiration and heart rate and temperature with our sensor. Um, and that's like a phase out there next once we make sure we've got this first component all put together. You know, my mom, when she would start falling and I would start to get these calls and it was just, it just went on and on. And when I would get one or two or three calls within a 24 hour, 36 hour window, here I am sitting in Denver telling the people in St. Louis, um, you need to check her for UTI, right? So we know that a lot of times, particularly with seniors, when they start to fall more frequently, there's a medical component, but right now we're not always able to detect what's going on. It's really hard to get a urine sample, for example, from someone with severe dementia, right? It's, it's not, not a walk in the park. And so looking at how these sensors can be used to detect other problems. And in our case, um, if we see that someone's heart rate's gone up or dropped, if we see their respiration has increased or severely decreased, right pre or post fall or during a fall, then that's, that's information that's useful for healthcare practitioners. So the fall detection stuff so far, I can't say I've seen anything that I'm gonna go out, that I would go out and buy, especially <laughs> like when my mom was still alive, I, I wouldn't have gone out and bought any of the stuff that's available for her. Mm -hmm. So I think we're, we're just at that space where it's gonna explode in the next five years with, with options. That's wonderful. Hopefully not exploding pants. Exactly. Those explode just, in a oh good way. Goodness. They're, no, it's hysterical. It's the you know it makes me think about how we did some remote remote monitoring for patients with COVID, for example, and like how much we've learned about remote monitoring and telemedicine and everything during this year, and hopefully it can get applied broadly. Um, the next question I want to I want to give to Dr. Griffith, um, moving to the clinical space, and I'm laughing a little bit because this is a good question. I got asked this myself recently when I went to a visit after skiing, and I didn't know how to answer. So. Screening question in many clinical encounters uh, that if you say, you know, are you afraid of falling? Or if you have said that you fell, then you get asked, do you have a fear of falling? Um, thoughts on the utility of that as a screening? I realize it's a little bit out of the specific work you do, but um, it does raise a question of like, what's the best way to be screening people for either fall risk or fear of falling? And, it, you know, what, how do we do that verbally? Or should we stop doing it verbally and look at other measures instead? I actually think this is an excellent question. Um, and the question itself is, is excellent because for example, when you go out like today, it's 70 degrees and sunny, are you afraid of falling on the sidewalk? No, you probably walk very briskly to your car. Now this Saturday, when there's going to be a lot of ice on the ground, are you gonna change your behavior because you're afraid to fall? You're more likely to fall given the environmental conditions and you're changing your behavior. So one of the reasons we ask if people are afraid they're gonna fall is because fear of falling actually is one of the risk factors of falling. So whether or not you're afraid gives me some good information. It also allows me to say, why is that? Tell me what fears you have. And that person might say, well, you know, I just, I'm dizzy when I stand up or, you know, I just feel like I can't really see as well out of my left eye. Or it may be something as simple as like, I'm afraid I'm gonna trip on the dog. Um, but it also, when patients are afraid of falling, they move differently. They might look at their feet more. They might reach out to the walls more. They might stop carrying items with them. They may be trying to use devices that they're, they're not trained to use or that are not appropriate for them. So I think it's that twofold. One, it's a risk factor if you're afraid. And two, it gives me an ability to engage you as to what you think the problems are and how we can find solutions together. And then finally, because your behavior will change with that fear. Makes sense. It makes me think about some of the work of older drivers and recognizing that sometimes people, um, if they're reducing, say, driving in bad weather, it's not because they're a bad driver. It's actually because they're very aware of risks and are taking steps to moderate those risks. But understanding kind of what's going on underneath is probably the, the most important piece, what's driving those behaviors. Yeah. Um, very specific question, but important one. Um, is the Falls Clinic at seniors still seeing patients? 
at, at the at the hospital? My understanding is no, they are not. They're looking for a replacement. Is that right? I hope so. Um, I don't know that they've found anybody to take that on, but I know at least the physical therapist who normally works in that clinic says they're not taking any patients at this time. Which is too bad. Hopefully they will kind of reopen. Can you comment briefly for any local clinicians in the audience where you, um, where you refer people if they have particular fall risks? I mean, certainly I'm guessing outpatient physical therapy, but are there other places you send people? Well, generally it depends on the circumstance. So a lot of patients who are really truly having fall issues, it would be a home care type of situation from an outpatient perspective. Also, we do have some programs within the University of Colorado Health System um, for Parkinson's and like other diagnoses specific groups with COVID. I'm not entirely sure if those groups are running. Um, most clinics, if you call an outpatient physical therapy clinic, should have somebody there that can specialize in balance training and helping people, whether it's from their age or polypharmacy or a neurodegenerative disorder, almost any physical therapist can help you. So as far as specific referrals, I don't know that that's necessary, um, but the link that I shared has a physical therapist finder on there. And it also in the comments will tell you what kind of physical therapist you should be looking for if based on what type of fall risk you have. And in Colorado, you can see a physical therapist without a primary care referral, right? So you can. It is a direct access state, which means you can see a physical therapist whenever you'd like to. Now, that being said, the caveat is it, it may depend on your insurance. So some insurances still have that like old requirement that you see your primary care physician first. I think personally that that just adds more hoops to jump through, particularly for people who are afraid of falling. If you are a patient who has Medicare, you can go directly to a physical therapist, and then we will send a plan of care to your physician for certification so that your physician or primary care provider is aware that you're being also managed by a physical therapist so we can work together. Okay, wonderful. Um, one last comment just came in, and um, uh, Dr. Griffith, you might be able to uh, elaborate on this. The Stepping On um, pro Program for Fall Prevention, I think, is run through the trauma uh, services uh, at the hospital. Is that right? And is that, do you know, is that something people can self-refer to? That I don't know, but it is a great program. There. I'll ask um, uh, Dr. Velopoulos, if you've got any other information, feel free to throw it in the chat. Uh, oh, Allison Weston says, yes, you can self-refer to that program. Great, thank you. Uh, Dr. Bodine, question for you. What is the latest thinking about floor surfacing in nursing homes? Grass, That's carpeting. <laughs> actually a really great question. Um, and you would think this would all be figured out, but it's not. So here, here's what typically happens. 99.9% .9 of uh, nursing homes or senior care facilities in the United States are slab on grade, which means concrete. Um, in dementia care facilities in particular, and most skilled nursing facilities, they are now moving to the polyvinyl flooring, like in hallways, dining rooms, all of those areas because of um, germs, cleanliness, those types of things. Um, and they are, and it's kind of a toss up. There is actually a lot of debate about this. In many cases, they're now using those square tiles, you know, that you can take out and replace should they go beyond the uh, initial ickiness stage. But it makes a huge difference for these seniors in terms of um, if they have, as, as Rebecca was talking about, if, if they're using a walker and they have poor gait, um, things like that, surfaces really matter. And if they slip or slide or if they're on carpet and fall, it makes a difference in the impact of the fall as well. So that recognition that the impact of the fall matters. And so there, um, I was just at a facility uh, well, it was right before COVID. <laughs> Everything seems to be pre-COVID. Um, but they were actually looking at what could they do between the concrete and the polyvinyl to actually um, improve and lessen the hardness of the falls because they were trying to reduce injuries that way, which I thought was really fascinating. It makes me think about the playgrounds now yeah. that are like, you can bounce off of, right? Not like the sharp wood chips when we were kids. <laughs> we just had gravel, you know, you fell off the jungle gym, bam, you're in the gravel. Uh, yeah. yeah, so it's really changed over the years for yeah. sure. I would just throw out there with flooring options too, that patterns matter. 
Yes, good point. So anybody who's walked in our hallways in the hospital and sees those different carpets, particularly within even just one hallway, the change in patterns matter. The shape of patterns matter. And so that's the other con concern when choosing flooring. Like, is this a pattern that's going to impair depth perception? Is this that stark of a transition that maybe somebody with Parkinson's might freeze here and have a fall? So considering that as part of flooring as well, and the conversations that I've heard about, like adding a little spring in the flooring, are that it would um, maybe be detrimental for our patients who have those retropulsive falls, just giving them that little bit that might throw them past their center of gravity posteriorly. Mm -hmm. oh, absolutely. So fascinating. That's a really tricky question, I think. Yeah, when we think about injury, right, and we think injury prevention, and we think about the different approaches, I, I love thinking about these engineering kind of environment approaches. And on that note, I actually would love to ask you each, this is maybe a hard question, but I'm sure you can, I'm sure you can tackle it. All right. So we're building a new hospital, right? I don't have any say over what's happening in that hospital, but if you could implement something kind of universally for fall prevention in the building of it, what do you, what, what do you think it would be? We talked about flooring, but are there sort of other things we should be doing in universal, universal design to uh, have safer environments overall? Space. People need more space. So if, in our current hospital rooms, especially in the emergency department, I mean, there's just, there are so many environmental factors. In the emergency department, those gurneys are very high. I can get people out of them. I have a very hard time getting people to climb back into them. But then trying to use a walker to maneuver between the bed and around the wall and under the TV and then to the door, like they don't have a lot of space for maneuverability. It's the same issue in the bathroom. And turns seem to be turning and backing up are huge risk factors for falls. So I would say if I had to choose one thing, it would be making sure that people have like the turning radius of a horse cart, you know, just so they can make sure they can get themselves their equipment, their IV pole, and a helper to all be able to maneuver safely with enough space. And I think for me, it would be around accessible equipment. And I'll give a great example. One of our student projects this year is um, looking at ultrasound for mammograms. And if you are someone who cannot get out of a wheelchair, it is virtually impossible to have a mammogram. And there, the statistics on women with cerebral palsy who, who is something like a not, or like something like 90% higher risk for death um, due to lack of accessible um, mammograms, pap smears, all of the medical technology. And to Rebecca's point, you know, she mentioned the gurney, getting back on the gurney, getting up on the table in an exam room is incredibly difficult. And that silly little stool that you're asking people to step up on and turn around and sit down, yike. Um, so we have a long way to go in um, accessibility of our actual medical equipment. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think some of that staff training too, and that physical yes. therapists are more than able and willing to consult with different departments on how to help you make patient care more accessible for your patients. We can help you get patients into a dental chair. We can help you get patients into and out of radiology. It's a training thing. We can train you and provide that expertise so that you can really provide the care to the people that need it the most. That's wonderful. Thank you, Rebecca. I hope you get lots of calls after that. So uh, yeah, but it makes me think about, you know, as we're building things, all of these other pieces and, you know, for for uh, delirium and disorientation prevention, why don't we make all the signage bigger and clearer and right? And things that, that we might just not think about because it's not something we've, we have been trained in or had to think about, but how do we use universal design to kind of um, impact multiple things at once? I think there's so much. I, I have a great example at university, the podiatry department. Uh, I had foot surgery years ago and I'm on Vicodin and crutches for the first time in my life. And I get off the elevator and it is all the way. It's like miles away. And I remember just standing there going, no. <laughs> <laughs> and we are poor little patients, you know, and to Rebecca's point, you know, in terms of physical plant, you know, we have our elevators on one end of the hallway and these poor patients have so far to travel. Um, which makes them exhausted by the time they get in for their exam. So are we getting a, an accurate exam to begin with? It's, it's a good question. And sometimes those are the patients that need the home care the most. 
Yeah. When I think about our layout and sending somebody to our, to an outpatient clinic, by the time you bathe, dress, get out to your car, get your walker in the car, get in the car, get to the building and walk in, do you have the capacity to truly participate in a physical therapy program at that time? That's a great example. Yeah. Yeah. That's wonderful. Well, thank you so much. I'm sorry that we are out of time because I could keep I could keep talking about this. There is a comment. If you aren't already, you might connect with Barry Martin in general internal medicine. It sounds like he's doing some work around accessibility issues also. Um, to the, all the attendees, thank you so much for coming. We will send out the link to the recording. And if you're interested in joining an informal discussion group tomorrow, Wednesday at 4 p.m. Mountain Time, please feel free to email us for the Zoom link. Uh, join us in April to talk about opioids. Um, and thank you again to our speakers, Drs. Bodine and Griffith. Have a wonderful and safe day. <laughs> Bye.